Well, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Deepak Srivastava, and I'm the president at the Gladstone Institutes. And uh, this year, I'm also serving as president of the International Society for Stem Cell Research, uh, which makes it all the more special to be able to administer the 2019 Ogawa Yamanaka Stem Cell Prize today. Uh, I should want to welcome all of you here in the audience, but also the over 150 people who are watching this uh, on a live stream uh, as well, uh, which is, uh, makes it all the more an exciting day for us to be able to recognize uh, really the promise of stem cell biology and regenerative medicine that we all feel in the field going forward. And I think uh, maybe just to encapsulate what that excitement is about that we're celebrating here today is that up till now, we have largely accepted that human disease will have taken root. And in our approach to that in medicine, we work around the edges of that, uh, accepting that the disease process is present. And the promise really is in the future, particularly with regenerative medicine, that we will no longer have to accept that premise. And we can actually begin to think about curing human disease at its root cause. And the regenerative medicine field and stem cell biology is one, among the easiest to understand how that would work because many human diseases are, occur simply because we have lost cells in our body that are supposed to do a certain function. And the most immediate and obvious way to correct that is to replace those lost cells. And that is the potential of stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. And our recipient today, Dr. Gordon Keller, as I'll tell you more in a moment, uh, is really embodies uh, and has facilitated the whole field's ability uh, to do exactly that going forward. Now, uh, the uh, Ogama Yamanaka Prize uh, uh, was set up by Hiro and Betty Ogawa uh, several years ago. And uh, Shinya Yamanaka uh, will tell you a bit more about them. But they have been uh, long-standing supporters of the Gladstone Institutes and uh, were initially uh, brought to us through an interaction with Warner Green, who is directing our Institute for Virology and Immunology and uh, has supported our science in that area. And many years ago, uh, came to develop a very close, uh, almost parent-like well, relationship with uh, Shinya Yamanaka, and then had decided to uh, create this award uh, to support uh, stem cell science. Now, this year, for the first time, uh, we are uh, co-branding this prize with uh, Cell Press. And uh, this, uh, I think, will give this uh, prize broader recognition throughout the world. Uh, and I'm uh, happy that uh, today uh, Debbie Sweet is here from uh, Cell Press, and I'd like her to come up uh, just for a moment and say a few words. Debbie? Thanks so much, Deepak. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Deborah Sweet. I'm the Vice President of Editorial at Cell Press. I, as many of you probably know me in my former life as the editor of Cell Stem Cell, but I've now moved on to this broader role. We're really excited to be partnering with the Gladstone Institutes on this prize. I think it's a wonderful recognition of the power of translational stem cell research, honoring the Ogawas and honor, honoring Shinya as well, and we who, with whom we have a very long-standing and productive relationship, which is great. Um, and this year, I'm particularly excited that uh, the prize is going to Gordon who's made such wonderful contributions in many areas of stem cell research, pluripotent cells, looking at uh, lineages related to cardiovascular and blood in particular, and really made a lot of contributions in areas that show a lot of promise. And I think another area where Gordon sh Gordon's work shines out is in his trainees and the way he's contributed to the field through developing scientists of the next generation. So I would like to really congratulate Gordon on this wonderful award, and I I'm looking forward to his lecture very much. Thank you. Now, uh, when uh, Hiro and Betty Ogawa set up this prize, they really wanted to uh, honor the stem cell field and the hard work of uh, investigators throughout the world who are trying to drive uh, stem cell-based discoveries towards making a difference for people. And they also wanted to honor the, uh, the groundbreaking discovery uh, made by Dr. Yamanaka with the induced pluripotent stem cell technology 
being able to convert an adult cell all the way back in time into one that behaved just like a pluripotent stem cell. And uh, uh, so I'd like uh, Shinya to come up uh, to say a few words about uh, Hero and Betty more personally. But uh, just by way of introduction, I know everybody in this audience uh, is well aware of Shinya, but for our online audience, uh, uh, Shinya uh, did, uh, was originally an uh, orthopedic surgeon and then decided to train in science and uh, fortunately was able to get a position here in San Francisco at the Gladstone Institutes in the mid-1990s as a postdoctoral fellow. And it was here that he uh, did, developed his initial scientific training uh, and then had gone back to Japan where he made uh, this groundbreaking discovery of induced pluripotent stem cells. We were fortunate enough to recruit him back to Gladstone as a senior investigator in 2007, and he's continued to run his laboratory here while also directing a large center in Kyoto, at Kyoto University called Saira, uh, where he's really advancing these uh, iPS-based technologies uh, towards uh, the clinic. Uh, so please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Shinya to say a few words about uh, Hiro and Betty. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so you can see Hiro and Betty on this uh, brochure. So uh, Hiro was a, a very successful businessman. Actually, uh, he became the first Japanese who made his company public in New York uh, Stock Exchange in 2007. So uh, that was his dream. Uh, to make his company public in New York. And once his uh, dream came true, he decided to give back to society as much as uh, possible, or together with his uh, wife, Betty. And one of his uh, way to giving back was to science, including Gladstone. So thanks to Warner, I believe Hiro and Warner met on a golf course. <laughs> but Hiro decided to support Warner's and Warner's colleagues' work uh, since 2008. That's when I met them for the first time, actually, in, in this room. I met Hiro and Betty uh, for the first time. And we became very, very close. Uh, they became my mentor mentor to myself and also to my wife, Shika. Uh, in 2014, they came to Japan to enjoy uh, cherry blossom. So it was early April. They came to my office in, in Kyoto. And they started talking about this prize. They say they wanted to create a new prize to celebrate stem cells. and. Uh, we didn't have enough time to finish our discussion. So I told them, well, I, I will be in San Francisco in two weeks. So let's discuss this more in two weeks. Then they left. And within that two weeks, uh, Betty passed away. Uh, so we, I, I was very shocked. So that means this prize is really uh, the last wheel of Betty Ogawa, and Hiro passed away uh, two years ago. Oh, we started this prize in 2015. We have uh, celebrated uh, four laureates, and uh, this year we are going to celebrate uh, Gordon. Uh, what Hiro and Betty said to me before Betty passed away, they want to celebrate not only the scientist, but also their spouse, because they know like science, uh, I'm sorry, like business, being a scientist is very tough. Without a huge support or help from their spouses, we cannot survive. So that's why they said we want to celebrate both the scientist and spouse. So today, Marion is with Gordon. I heard Marion has been helping uh, Gordon in many ways, not only at home, but also uh, in the lab. So uh, it's a perfect fit 
to this prize. Congratulations again, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shinya. And over the years, we've had many uh, 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 couples uh, who have jointly uh, pursued their scientific dreams, including our first recipient, uh, Masayo Takahashi, uh, who has uh, did beautiful work with the first uh, transplantation uh, of iPS-derived cells. And uh, her husband, Jun Takahashi, uh, also uh, was uh, involved uh, in uh, the production of those cells, and uh, so it was a, another example of a good uh, team effort. Uh, so at this time, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce our awardee, uh, Dr. Gordon Keller. Uh, Dr. Keller is uh, currently the director of the McEwen Stem Cell Institute uh, in the University of Toronto. Uh, he has been there since 2007 in that uh, position. He did, uh, received his PhD, PhD degree in Alberta. Uh, having been originally from Canada, and did his postdoctoral training at the Ontario Cancer uh, Institute. Uh, he had uh, traveled, spent some time in Europe uh, following that, uh, and uh, ultimately was on the faculty at Mount Sinai for many years before being recruited back uh, to Canada. Um, and uh, in 2007, as I mentioned, where he's been the director of the McEwen Center since. Uh, Dr. Keller has uh, been at the uh, center of the stem cell revolution that's occurred over the last uh, two decades when pluripotent stem cells were first uh, been able to culture from mouse cells. Gordon was involved in trying to coax those cells into various cell types. And when human stem cells, embryonic stem cells, could first be cultured in the late 1990s, Gordon was among the first who was really driving towards making that a useful technology by creating a variety of cell types, and he will um, uh, share some of those historical details with you today, I understand. Uh, given his position in the field and his pioneering spirit, uh, he was a founding member of the International Society for Stem Cell Research, and in, in fact, in 2006, uh, was the president of the ISSCR and held that meeting in Toronto, which is particularly fitting for today's prize because 2006 was the year that iPS cells were first publicly described by Shinya, and in fact, that was discussed, uh, Shinya presented the iPS discovery before it was published at the June ISSCR meeting that year in 2006 in Toronto that uh, Gordon uh, presided over. Uh, so uh, this is a, a nice full circle with uh, Shinya and Gordon here, and, and Debbie, uh, may, I don't remember if you mentioned, but. Uh, the initial iPS cell discovery was, in fact, published in 2006 in the September issue of Cell as well. Uh, so um, I think it's fair to say that uh, where we are today with stem cell biology uh, would not have been possible without uh, Dr. Keller and his laboratory's uh, uh, efforts to take those pluripotent stem cells and utilize often the knowledge from developmental biology and coax those cells into various uh, types of hematopoietic cells, cardiac cells, neural cells, et cetera, liver cells, endoderm-derived cells. And in each case, the field had been stuck, where, yes, we had pluripotent cells, yes, we could make cells that we wanted, either for disease modeling or transplantation, but we couldn't do it very well. And until you could scale the process, we were pretty stuck. And in each case, Gordon's lab came in and led the way and sh shined the light to how we could all make those cells and then learn a tremendous amount uh, from those. Uh, so Gordon, it's my pleasure to uh, 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 give you the 2019 uh, Ogawa Yamanaka Prize, which is a beautiful crystal piece uh, and a $150,000 prize. Uh, and at this time to uh, uh, give that to you, I'd like to invite uh, Shinya and Debbie up to the stage as well. And Gordon, please. Beautiful. All right. I am supposed to look at Lauren. Where's Lauren? There you are, <laughs> so that she can see this nicely for posterity. And uh, Gordon, if you could please come up, and Shinya and Debbie.
And this is a beautiful, uh, please hold it, it's very heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this uh, uh, is a special piece that we had uh, made for this prize, with the top of it uh, being the, the Waddington diagram of illustrating how a, uh, a cell may adopt, roll down the hill and adopt one of different fates. Uh, and Shinya's discovery really was to take a cell that might be in a differentiated state in one of these valleys and push that back up the hill to, and reset it to a pluripotent state so it was ready again to go into multiple different uh, states. So, Gordon, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did I go? Yes, I did. I will. Mm -hmm. Right now. <coughs> well, thank you so much, Deepak, Shinya. Uh, and I'd just like to say a word about Betty and Harrow. We knew them quite well, my wife Marion and I, and the whole stem cell community knew them from their involvement in ISSCR and uh, the stem cell research community and their, their great support beyond just this prize, but just the encouragement from them and their interest in the biology that we did. So I would like to thank them as well for having the vision to create this prize and to set the stage very, very, the, the bar very, very high as to what we want to do. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to give this lecture. I look out in the audience and I, I literally see the future of stem cell research. I mean, it's terrific to see all the young trainees here that you will carry forward what we have been doing for the last 30 odd years on trying to understand how stem cells adopt a fate in a Petri dish. So rather than looking forward, though, I'm going to take you for the first part of the talk on a bit of a trip through history and tell you how I got involved in this, in this uh, field. But this is really what we all put up uh, on slides now as to our, what we, we know already what these stem cells can do. And we can coax these stem cells into making cell types that represent populations within the different tissues that I show you here. And the overall goal, and we've heard already from uh, Deepak and Shinya, that is to repair the cell types in the organ rather than having to replace the entire organ in the case of disease. And so these are really w what was once only a dream. We, this is now close to reality where we can take the cell types that we make and apply them to understanding developmental biology push forward with new therapies for disease, or with the discovery of IPS, understand disease processes in a Petri dish. And with that, the ultimate goal is novel therapeutics. That's 2019. So how did I get involved? And uh, it happened more than 30 years ago in a small town in Switzerland, and this is a Basel, for those of you who haven't been there, along the Rhine River. It sits on the crossroads of Germany, France, and Switzerland. And uh, I was, uh, at that time, an investigator at the Basel Institute for Immunology. And this was, a, this was an academic research institute funded by Hoffman Roche, but it was, La Roche. But it was, a mecca, it was a mecca for immunology, and it drew investigators from around the world. And uh, so at that point, one day, I went to a seminar by the... Dr. Rolf Kemmler, he had come down from Tübingen, and this was about three years after mouse pluripotent stem, mouse ES cells were discovered, and he gave a talk about how you could take these ES cells and take them out of their Petri dish, and they would just coalesce into these massive structures. And it was a very simple experiment, which I thought was fascinating, and he showed this massive aggregate of cells, I don't know if you can see it very well here, where uh, these were floating what he called cystic embryoid bodies. And in the, in the wall of them, you could see patches of erythroid cells, some vascular cells, and you don't see it here. There was actually areas of contraction. This was a seminar in 1984. The paper was published a year later. And we were so fascinated by this that uh, we started collaborating with Rolf. And my wife, Marion, and I, we would drive up into the Black Forest, and he would hand us off a flask of these, and we'd take them back to Basel. 
and try and dissociate them. And a good colleague of mine, Ralph Schnotgrass, who is here, we would try and break these, these things apart and try and figure out what they were. We didn't succeed very well in, that, in those days, but it set the stage that you can take a stem cell out of its stem cell conditions and you can make something like this. And that was in 1984. And so fast forward to when we moved to Denver and we decided at that point that we were going to launch a lab in North America and would focus entirely on mouse embryonic stem cell differentiation. And I, I list all of the people who have contributed, or as many, many of the people that have contributed to the mouse stem cell differentiation work. I always think it's best to make these acknowledgments because it is really the highly skilled and highly talented trainees that drive these programs for you. And uh, so thank you all for who's contributed to, to the, our efforts early on in making mouse embryonic stem cells and, and driving them into different cell types. So, this is what we knew about embryonic stem cell differentiation in 1990. There's no animation here. This is what we knew. <laughs> there was nothing, nothing in the literature, uh, with the exception of probably Rolf's paper and a few others. So it was literally a blank slate. So we went to work, we rolled up our sleeves, and we started in a very simple approach where we took the ESLs, much like we'd witnessed from the Kemmler lab, and at that time, our only inducer of differentiation was something called fetal calf serum. Many of you probably never use it anymore in tissue culture. And it was a mixture of probably good growth factors, inhibitors, but it did support differentiation. And we, we could get differentiated cell types. And we had a hematopoietic background, so we focused on hematopoiesis because there were good assays. And we knew something about the dynamics of hematopoiesis in the early embryo. And at that time, we already started paying attention to what's happening in the embryo and try and do parallel work in the Petri dish, because we felt that if we weren't recapitulating what's happening in the embryo, the model may not really be what we had hoped it to be. So the, the, the developmental biology tells us something about the dynamics of lineage development, what we might want to expect in the Petri dish. Also importantly, and I'll show you, it gives us the recipe for identifying the signaling pathways that drive stem cell development in, in culture. And so this is how we set up. And we, we use blood because it's got two very distinct programs. It's more complicated than this. But let me, for this talk, let's assume there's a yolk sac, very early primitive program that is launched to keep the embryos, your embryo, the embryo alive, and then a more definitive program that sets up adult hematopoiesis. But there, there were very nice clonal assays where you would take your differentiated cells from an embryo or from an embryoid body, put them in a, a semi-solid matrix, and grow blood cell colonies and count them. And at that time, we found that the primitive ones had a very distinct growth. Uh, the colonies that came from the primitive regenerators had a very distinct growth characteristic and expressed embryonic globin, whereas the adult gave larger colonies and expressed fetal or adult, depending if it's mouse or human. And so here we were now, we could say, well, we have these assays. Can we at least recapitulate something as simple as primitive and definitive hematopoiesis? And, and, and uh, for, for those who are starting a lab or thinking of it, you need, when you're getting into something like this where there's not much known, you need a win early on. And I'm going to show you our first win. And that was just to simply take the em embryos side by side with the uh, embryoid bodies and ask what happens. And this is some of the early work that Marion was, and a colleague, Jim Pallas, and another colleague, Michael Wiles, worked on. And here you see it. So if you take the mouse yolk sac, and you just have to, this is the primitive progenitors. It's very defined, 48 hours, and it's over. So we had already something to look for in our embryoid bodies. And this was it. Much the same, the primitive program came and went. It went. It's a little bit more broad because of the culture system. But nevertheless, it told us that we were pretty much recapitulating the early dynamics. And we, we viewed this as a very important step forward, that the model at least was recapitulating something uh, as simple as this. But that then said, well, if we can do that, why don't we look earlier? What's happening before we get blood? Because now 
we have access to all kinds of embryonic cells because you just make as many as you want. And I think that, if anything, is one of the real powers of the system from a developmental biology perspective. And so you could just take all these early stages, put it into this assay, and simply ask what grows. And what we found was a type of colony that kind of looked like a cluster of grapes, if you want. But the important thing is, if you tore it apart, it had blood cells and vascular cell progenitors. And these were clones we went on to show. And this, in turn, fact, turned out to be the tissue culture equivalent of a cell called the hemangioblast. And this was hypothesized in the early 1900s already that blood and vascular cells came from a, a common progenitor. But you couldn't access the early embryo to really go after it, and here we could. And so it has a progenitor with, it is a progenitor with blood and vascular potential. It's very defined. After day four, you never find them. And it, it really defines the beginning of primitive hematopoiesis. So it sits at the head of that early blood cell program. But here, once we had this information, we could go back to the mouse embryo, and this is an early E7-ish mouse embryo, and find those progenitors in the developing mouse embryo as well. So it gave us the information we needed to go back and ask the question, does this happen in vivo? So it's not just a one-way street. So then we ask, well, if we can do that, what about other early events? Because we could now imagine, and this was kind of controversial to some developmental biologists, could we look at germ layer specification and quote-unquote gastrulation in the dish? And uh, when you start moving into these areas, you, you get a little pushback at, in those days. But nevertheless, uh, this, this is kind of a very simple scheme of developmental biology of the early, early embryo. This should probably be a single cell layer, but nevertheless, we go from an epiblast to an early gastrulating embryo, and it's defined by a primitive streak. It's an epithelial structure on the posterior side where cells egress and move out in this region as mesoderm and this region as endoderm. And so this is just showing that. So this is where you get the mesoderm and the endoderm. And they're marked by many different genes. We selected two in those days. One was brachiuria, or T, marks the entire streak. And then this region, which gives rise to endoderm, we chose FOXA2. And then, of course, you could layer on a lot of the regulatory pathways. And it's really only a handful. We look at BMP, WINT, and nodal. We use activin as a surrogate for nodal, and then the corresponding agonists and antagonists of these pathways. So we went ahead and made a reporter line, and this is long before CRISPR was in, but it was still possible to do uh, genetic engineering and make reporters. And so this is, uh, this is what we, we, we did. We actually introduced the uh, GFP into the T locus and a, and a truncated CD4 into FOXA2, and that allowed you to visualize that with, uh, with an antibody. And this is really work that a good colleague of ours, Hans-Jörg Failing did, and a, and a fellow in the lab, Paul Gadu. And really, it allows us to follow early development, and it provided a model for identifying the signaling pathways that regulate these early events. And that really, I think, allowed us to move forward. And I'll just summarize what we found with this. I just want to show you one experiment, how we were thinking in those days, where at day three-ish, 3.25, we could drive the system with, still with serum, but you would see these are your brachiuria cells, and they co-express a receptor tyrosine kinase FLIC1. This was a marker of mesoderm, blood and cardiac mesoderm. And if you assayed, sorted and assayed these FLIC1, that's where your hemangioblasts were found. Okay, so that was the beginning of primitive hematopoiesis. But you can see there's still brachiuria cells there. So we simply cu sorted, we cultured them for a further 24 hours and found a second FLIC1 population and then assayed this and found that we could grow out progenitors that had cardiac and vascular potential. And if you put these cells into a monolayer culture, they would produce contracting cardiomyocytes. Uh, and additionally, we found that there was actually another hematopoietic program here, which had some T cell potential. So we recognized that this could be a population with cardiac and definitive blood. And this was work by Steve Katman, Stefan Irian, and Raiden Clark, amongst others. Uh, but the goal, the real message here is there's a temporal uh, 
pattern to development, even in very crude conditions that are driven by serum. And that was really something that fascinated us, that how could this very primitive group of cell culture conditions support something like this? So that led us then to, to transitioning to define conditions and identifying pathways that regulate these, these early germ layers. And one thing we never, ever got out of the serum-induced culture is endoderm. And so this was a postdoctoral fellow at, at Sushi Kubo came to the lab and was very interested in making endoderm. And at that point, there was experiments in Xenopus that said active ingredients would give you different outcomes in a primitive animal cap experiment. And so we looked at that in this system with Hatsushi and asked the question, uh, what happens? And here you can see the type of experiments you can do where you would have increasing amounts of activin, and this is increasing amounts of this reporter. And that was good, but what's more interesting, and this is very out of date now, PCR approach, but you could see that on lower amounts of activin induction, we'd get more of a skeletal muscle readout. No activin, we had residual ectoderm, and high levels, we got expression patterns indicative of liver development. So that was the first time we could really in, say we're getting an endoderm derivative in the culture dish. So this was really what we thought an important step forward. And then we used the same approach with all these agonists and antagonists of these pathways and really started teasing apart how do you make the different mesoderm and endoderm derivatives, and I'm going to summarize a huge effort in one slide here. What we knew from the mouse system was that both Wnt and Activin were required to make a, a, a brachiary positive cell, because you could show that by adding agonists and antagonists to the pathways. BMP was not important. BMP, on the other hand, once you had the primitive streak, came in and further patterned the type of mesoderm or endoderm you would make. So in those days, we reasoned if you want to make endoderm and derive it to a liver fate, you would have lots of active and low BMP, and that still holds true today. And this, the liver work was then taken on by Valerie Gowan Evans in the lab. Cardiac mesoderm, somewhere in between, and blood, very little active in, and lots of BMP. And that's really what launched us then to moving forward to, to the human system. This gave us real clarity, if you want, on how you would make the different cell types. So this was then in the late 90s. We translated to the human, well, actually the early 2000s when we had moved to New York. And as we already heard, human embryonic stem cells uh, were identified in the late 90s, and the human-induced pluripotent stem cells were reported by Shinya and others in 2007. So now we had human material. And I'm going to, again, uh, summarize just a lot of work, but show you almost the same slide because the translation was remarkable. We would show much the same regulators early on of, mes of primitive streak-like cells and the various germ layers. And now we, can, we had a liver and pancreas program. Liver was driven by uh, Shinichiro Ogawa, pancreas by uh, Christina Nostra. But in the liver, we then branched out and said we can make more than just hepatocytes. We showed you can make cholangiocytes, and now we can make most of the cells in the liver. Uh, we had a program looking at chondrocytes and cartilage. This was uh, headed by uh, uh, April Kraft. And then cardiac mesoderm, and I will talk about the people involved there, and blood as well. Uh, this is really the translation that worked exceptionally well. Obviously, lots of work to get here, but this still holds true. We can make these various cell types. We were running all of these programs at one time in the lab, and now we have m focused really on, erythro on, on hematopoiesis and liver, and the others are now taken on by trainees who have started their own labs. So it's, it's really rewarding to see that what you have started, people take on and carry forward. And again, giving credit again to the, the outstanding team of people that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. This is all the people who have contributed and are contributing, this is my current lab members as well, to the efforts of uh, generating human derivatives from pluripotent stem cells. And here's a list of collaborators that we do a lot of work with. So again, it's not a single person involved. It's team efforts now that drive this forward. 
So let me just summarize two, uh, several experiments from blood and human, and I'll close in with just some, some general comments. But we moved, as we moved to Toronto, we focused entirely on human pluripotent stem cells. And the blood program at that time was driven by Marion, Chris Sturgeon, Andrea De Tati, and Geneva Wong. And the goal was, can we move forward to get true definitive hematopoiesis? So this is the standard uh, scheme I used to show the differentiation along, along from through a primitive streak-like cell and mesoderm and the derivative hematopoietic cells. The marker sets, and again, we were fortunate to show that we could get a human, human hemangioblast. The timing was almost identical to what we found in the mouse, so the translation, again, was very good. Uh, here's some of the, the, mar the cytokines we used, but all important is early on, it's a really a BMP-driven program. And what we did find then, when, as we got more sophisticated with our approaches, is we could, instead of using the two types of erythroid, we used primitive erythroid and T-cell development as a surrogate for a definitive. And under these conditions, we found that we could get both. So it told us that our dish had both primitive and what we think is definitive hematopoiesis in the same culture. So that was exciting, but it wasn't satisfying because it was mixed. It's like we mixed the yolk sac with the intraembryonic region of the embryo, and we had a gemisch in the Petri dish. And so at that point, we started asking, well, can we, can we further tease apart what's happening? And here, we went into some very careful timing. And, and this is not not in making the primitive streak. These are the same pathways that regulate primitive streak. We also found if you just bump them up a bit, uh, time-wise, they will also impact mesoderm development. And I show you a timing here of 1.75 to 3 days. That's the precision we're looking at. And again, I'm just summarizing work. We found that if you inhibit WINT and allow active and nodal signaling uh, to continue during this very specific time window, you essentially inhibit it all definitive and had in the dish only primitive hematopoiesis. And the reverse was too true. If you inhibited activin and allowed wind signaling, or you activated wind, you drove definitive at the expense of primitive. So you had, for the first time, control of what you were trying to make. And we then had the opportunity to look at some of the early progenitor populations. I just highlight this. This is what's called a hemogenic endothelium, endothelial cell. It is the defined progenitor of hematopoietic cells. It's got an endothelial characteristic, so we had first time access to this and allowed it to make hematopoietic cells. So here's really what we found. But more importantly, we found a surface marker, CD235A. It's, it, we're not sure if it's A or B, but it's CD235 because the antibody sees both, we realize. But nevertheless, it marks this mesoderm and not this mesoderm. And so now we could separate out very early on the mesoderms that make the different blood cells. And so, does this matter? I'm going to give you two examples of how it might. So we now know through lineage tracing experiments that there's groups of macrophages in our tissues that derive from the yolk sac, in other words, from primitive hematopoiesis. There's a huge interest now in asking, can we use these cells as a therapeutic? Do we, can we replace tissue macrophages? And is there a therapeutic angle there? So to get tissue macrophages, if we, if we adhere to the lineage tracing approach, we went primitive. And so here's a very easy way you can do that and end up with tissue-specific macrophages. I just use microglia as an example. On the other hand, if you're imagining an allogeneic CAR T cell product for immunotherapy, you wouldn't want your cultures cluttered with primitive, but rather you'd want to drive more of the definitive program. So these are the manipulations long before we get a hematopoietic stem cell that can have applications for therapeutics. Most of our ongoing studies in our lab now are in trying to make the hematopoietic stem cell. And actually, we started with this question 30 years ago, and we're still at it. And so you have to be determined in this business, and you have to be a bit thick-skinned if you're going to get there. And we're, we're still going after it. And, I probably won't retire till I get it, <laughs> or I might. <laughs> Anyways, this is what our current efforts are. And let me close then with cardiovascular development in the last few minutes. It's one of our major programs now in the lab. A number of you have heard this story. I'm just going to summarize and show you some of the parallels to blood cell development. But really, 
it came to it came to us and many in the field. Of course, everyone knew there's many cell types in the heart. But when we first saw beating heart cells, we, we didn't even ask the question, what were they? We were so excited. But now we understand that ventricular cardiomyocytes, atrial cardiomyocytes, the pacemaker cells, they're all separate lineages, probably coming from separate, separate progenitors. Then there's a secondary pacemaker, atrial ventricular node pacemaker. The heart is surrounded by epicardial cells. It's lined by a special endocardial layer. And the wall has, of course, more than just cardiomyocytes. It's got coronary vascular cells, smooth tissue macrophages. I just mentioned the tissue macrophages and cardiac fibroblasts. So we can make most of these cell types now. I'm not going to go through some of it's published. What's not yet published is the endocardium, but we have a very good protocol for this. So it was our goal. Once you could make heart cells, the next question is, can we make all of the heart cells? And that's really a, a mission we've had. And why do you want to do that? Well, if you want to treat, study and treat diseases, there is diseases that affect different parts of the heart. So if you have a heart attack, it's likely it's, it's in the left ventricle, and you're going to lose a billion plus cells. If you're going to study atrial fibrillation, you want, you want atrial cells. And if you ever dream of looking at pacemaker disorders or a biological pacemaker, you want to know how to make pacemaker cells. And so we looked at heart development. And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But really, it is a mesoderm derivative. Uh, you need to activate these pathways and inhibit Wnt to make cardiomyocytes. It forms a crescent then in the anterior region of the embryo, coalesces into a heart tube where you start getting atrial and ventricular specification. Heart looping gives you the atria on top, and then your four-chambered heart. So we had to try and do some of this in the dish. We're not going to make a four-chambered heart, but we can make the different cell types. I'm just going, I'm going to summarize really what we've done. Other and I'm going to show this because it's so essential to, to what we do. Retinoic acid signaling is critical for the atrial ventricular development. And this was shown uh, a number of years ago, uh, where you, you inhibit RA signaling in the embryo, and you lose atrial development. You activate it. You get enlarged atrial, lose ventricle. But if you miss the window, nothing changes. And so this told us that. This is going to be important for making atrial cells. And uh, Nadia Rosenthal had shown that. She then came up with a model, and this is an important model, and you'll see in a minute, where the, the idea is that the progenitors that make the atria uh, are specified first in the absence of retinoic acid, and they contribute to this part of the developing heart tube. And then the progenitors that make the uh, atria and the sinus a sinoatrial node are made later, and they migrate through or they express an enzyme that's involved in retinoic acid signaling, RALDH2. And so here we would have it then, real information on how we want to go after making atrial and ventricular cardiomyocytes. And this is uh, work that Steve Katman and Nic Nicole Dubois were doing uh, when we first started the human program uh, uh, in, in, in optimizing in optimizing the, the development uh, uh, of the dif uh, differentiation. I should mention that we had previously shown that it was possible to make cardiomyocytes from pluripotent cells, and we did see the same cardiovascular progenitor. And that was uh, Lei Yang who did that work while we were still in New York. Uh, but really, this then took it a step further. And Steve showed that, really, one could tweak the system uh, here by manipulating BMP activin, because this was essential. We had to inhibit Wnt. We then had markers, and we then found SERP alpha. This was Nicole's work showed that we could get SERP alpha on the surface to mark progress to cardiomyocytes. And the reason I mention this is this allowed you to get over line to line variation, because each line had its own demands on signaling. If you did this tweaking, you could get most lines to work. And I, I, I do have to show one movie. Uh, and this is just that you've seen this many, many times from many people. You can get beautiful sheets of cardiomyocytes developing if you get the conditions right. And this is just a way to look at how many of these cells are cardiomyocytes. They're over 90%. And not surprisingly now, they're mostly ventricular because there was no retinoic acid in the system. 
So this is our, our efforts, and this has been published. I'm just going to summarize quickly. Ventricular and atrial cardiomyocyte, what we found. RA signaling was essential for human uh, atrial development, and it was very stage-specific as it was in the mouse. Uh, atrial and ventricular developed from distinct mesoderms, atrial from RALD H2, as we predicted from the mouse, and surprisingly ventricular from CD235A mesoderm, the same marker that marks primitive hematopoietic mesoderm. Is it the same mesoderm? We're, we're not sure. And they're induced by different concentrations of BMP4 and activin. And if you want the good, the enriched cells, you should make the right mesoderm. I'm not going to show the data, but we found, and this is Stephanie Protze and Ji-Hun Lee have done this work, where we have RA addition specifically between day and three and five, and it totally specifies an atrial fate. Beyond five, doesn't matter, you get ventricular cells. So that gives you that same window as we saw in the mouse embryo. I'm going to show just this experiment because it tells you really what the, the, the take-home message. This is a mesoderm that has a bit of what we think is a ventricular and a bit of atrial. We sorted these cells. We cultured them in retinol. That should only work on these cells if the model is correct, or retinoic acid should work as these. Because if you give retinoic acid, you bypass the requirement for the machinery to synthesize retinoic acid, and you, the cells will respond if they have the receptor. What this tells you here is that all of the cells made cardiomyocytes. If you look at the ventricular marker, in the presence of retinol, these cells without the enzyme do not convert to an, uh, an atrial cell. If you bypass with RA, they do. The green cells make some ventricular cells in the absence. We don't know what they are but they respond to retinol and retinoic acid, as we would predict from the model. And the reverse is true for the atrial markers. And so what it told you then, that we have a ventricular mesoderm and an atrial mesoderm patterned early, and this is how you make your two lineages of the heart. Now, you, you saw from that, that, uh, that, uh, that fax plot, we weren't very good at making, in those conditions, either of those mesoderm. And here we go back to our optimization approach and uh, just measured, can we Im improve this? And indeed you can. So look at, if this is now just the concentrations of nanograms per mil of BMP and activin, you get a beautiful aldeflor positive cell now, RALD H2, you can, this is just a fluorescent a method of measuring aldehyde dehydrogenase. As we know, this is RALD H2, no 235A. If you up the activin in particular, but also the BMP, you get lots of 235A and not RALD H2. So here's a way to make more of one or the other type of mesoderm by understanding early development. And so this is, gets us to this model, and then we can layer on uh, the pacemaker cells. They also come from this mesoderm, although we don't know if it's the same type cell that does atrial and, and the pacemaker. But we, they are identified by the lack of the transcription factor NKX2.5. It's expressed in most parts of the heart with the exception of the pacemaker, and that's how we found it. We had a line that reported on NKX2.5. So that's really a lineage diagram of human heart development. And all important is what you do early. So now, of course, you can start, I'm not, uh, we're just working on this, you can do molecular characterization of all these different stages and start asking how are they related, but importantly, can we af find additional markers and ad additional signaling pathways that would further help us in driving the appropriate cell type. So let me close with saying we came all this way. Is there application? to what we do, and of course, many people are working on various applications of these cells. Um, and so myocardial infarction, if uh, the ascending vessel is, or descending, I guess, is occluded, you will have what's called a heart attack, and a lot of your myocytes will die. And the simplistic view is we transplant ventricular cardiomyocytes and make new muscle. And this thought was around for a long time. And it was really at an ISSCR meeting that Chuck Murray showed some of the work that he and Michael Laflamme were doing, where they were looking in uh, primate, uh, non-human primate infarcted hearts where they had transplanted human myocytes 
and showed this beautiful human graft. And I still remember very clearly that, that ISSCR meeting, and I think that changed everyone's view that, in fact, you can do this. You can take cells from a dish, put them into a heart, and make new muscle. What they also showed is that they replace a significant portion of the scar. They electrically integrate, which is important. Uh, and in more recent work, Chuck has some evidence of restoration of heart function, but most of the animals display transient arrhythmias. And one possibility is this is due to mixed populations. We're not sure what the interpretation is, but it was one possibility. Uh, since that paper, we recruited Michael Laflemme to Toronto. He set up a pig model where he's done very similar things, and now you can see in this model, this is all, this is the, the, the blue is the infarcted area in the apex of the pig heart, and all of this is human heart muscle. And this is in a paper published earlier this year. And the pig heart, of course, is much larger than the primate heart, so it's more of a model of human disease. Uh, so what we do, would it help? Well, here's a typical differentiation where there's always some pacemaker cells contributing. If you optimize your ventricular development, you can get rid of them, and they track, as I indicated, much more with the atrial population. And as you purge the system of pacemakers, the beating rate goes down. Now, is that the solution? We don't know, but these are some of the lines of thinking one would follow to try and make a better product. So is this the optimal product or some version of it? I would think some version of a ventricular myocyte going forward would be what we would like to transplant. And so simply then, how does one do this? You generate cardiomyocytes. You have to optimize uh, cardiomyocyte development. In the early days, this was done with CCRM in Toronto. Um, this is now taken over largely by a bio, biotech company, uh, Blue Rock Therapeutics, who have taken on this program to drive it forward to, to a therapy where you envision uh, efficacy studies in the pig model and uh, safety testing in small animals and moving forward. And this is now, as I indicated, work together that's being done with Blue Rock Therapeutics and, of course, Michael Laflemme. And I, by way of declaration, I am a scientific co-founder of Blue Rock Therapeutics. Uh, none of the work I've shown today is supported by them, but I am now serve in an advisory role for the company. And we're very excited by the opportunity to see what we once worked out as a way to make cardiomyocytes may someday lead towards a new therapy for heart disease. So I have two slides left, and I, I wasn't quite sure how to end this. But I'm ending it with 30 years of experience, and what have we done? Um, well, we know that if we wanted to realize this, we had to understand this. And that, I hope I've convinced you, is the track we've taken for the past 30-odd years of understanding how these cells are regulated and how you can manipulate conditions to make a, a better product. And I, I usually show this at the beginning, but I chose to show it at the end. That, and, it, and it's obvious, I guess, that if you're going to study disease or treat it, you really need to know what cell type you want to either study or replace. And then you need to go ahead and use this knowledge and make it in appropriate numbers to either study the disease or treat it. And again, that's really what we've been trying to do, and I think that's what many others are following and trying to do as well. And secondly, we've used developmental biology. We've used developmental biology as our guide. And the biology is there, and it's not to think that there's anything magical about human development. There are some differences, of course, but you can learn a lot from the developmental biologists, and they've been, the, 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 it's been tremendous to read the old literature and try and understand what we should be doing in the dish. But I think we can also contribute and have contributed back to understanding the hemangioblasts, the early mesoderms that you can access from human systems now, blood mesoderms, heart mesoderms, how different are they? You can just make dishes, dishfuls of them and do your studies. You can't access a human embryo at this stage, and the mouse is very small. So I think it is a contribution, but it's really the insights that I hope will get us to a therapeutic application for the work we've done. And with that, I would like to, again, thank Betty and Hero, uh, Deepak, Shinya,
for, for really this honor of receiving this award, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Gordon. I think uh, you can I'll see why the uh, selection committee uh, sel uh, chose uh, Gordon this year. So I should say the selection committee is composed of uh, a number of other faculty from around the world uh, who participate with us, including George Daly, who's the dean at the Harvard School of Medicine, uh, Hideyuki Okano, who's the dean at Keio School of Medicine, Fiona Watt, who's at uh, King's College in London, uh, and Lawrence Studer, who's at uh, Sloan Kettering, and uh, Shinya Yamanaka and myself. Uh, we do have some time for questions from the audience. I will ask you to use a microphone because for the live stream audience, uh, Benoit, let me give you a microphone. Thanks, Gordon, that was really wonderful. Um, when, when we're looking at cardiac myocyte development in, in a dish, right, we, you, you showed the, the, the sheet of beating cells, yeah. but initially they start beating in little areas, then eventually find one another. Yeah. Um, wh what can you tell us about what's actually happening in terms of the patterning of the cells during that differentiation? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we don't know what happens. Um, we don't know what causes them to integrate, what enhances the integration. Uh, it's, it's really unknowns that I think can be, can be addressed. Uh, the other thing I should have mentioned, it's along these similar lines, is the cells we make, once they, co uh, once they form these, these sheets of beating carrying mice, they're still very, very immature. And so the other challenge we have is how do you push them further along the pathway to resemble much more an adult cardiomyocyte. And, and uh, secondly, there's still further segregation. I said ventricular. We don't know if they're right or left. We don't know a lot about those ventricular cells yet. Uh, so there's still work to do, and I see a, a lot of young people out here who I'm sure can tackle some of these problems. Great. Uh, Casey? That was a great talk. And you actually just sort of answered my question, which was about the ventricular cardiomyocytes and whether they were left or right. right. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that you're working on, and do you think that's maybe contributing to the arrhythmias that they're seeing in the animal model? So, yeah, we are working on that, absolutely. We want to get a handle on left versus right, first heart field, second heart field, because that's further specification that we're interested in. So the question of what is the best cell to transplant, you know, not much is known because it's just recently we've had these cells to transplant, but you can imagine going into a model where you would start asking, is if we're making left, is that better than right? Is it a mixture better? I don't know. What happens if you put atrial cells in a ventricle? We don't know, but we can do it now. Bruce? Terrific talk. Um, uh, too terrific talk again. The, um, you know, the, there's, there's all this work also with the organoid cultures that yeah. is going on in parallel and some surprising cell types which show up and patterns that happen when you have different cell types together. Your, your diagrams are, are, are beautiful and we th you can think about them as a linear path, but how can we start, start constructing or, or thinking about cell types which form together yeah. uh, and particularly essentially taking your systems and potentially adding you know, multiple cell types and then getting a, a different kind? Right. So it's a really good question. So the, the way we've been going at it is to get the purest population we can now for access to those cells is good. For biology, we may be going too far. So I think there's two ways to do it. You can get the, you can direct the path, the differentiation to purity for whatever you want to mix. Let's say myocytes, endothelial cells, and macrophages. Let's say, or you can back off, and if you have good certainty, you have a highly pure mesoderm stage. You could just let that differentiate on its own and make the cell types together. And I think those are two complementary approaches. But I think the, the second depends on having really your starting progenitor where you want it and not making a teratoma in a dish if you want. Gordon, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, as you mentioned, we need to optimize BMP and activin concentrations yeah. for each individual IPS and oh. ESO lines. And I o always wonder uh, whether that kind of optimization is happening in, in vivo during <laughs> development. Mm. 
so the question is, I guess everyone heard it, is, is, is are we having optimization of signaling pathways in vivo? I guess we probably are if we're here. Something was optimized. <laughs> but uh, I think the part of the optimization is given the, the differences in the, in the internal signaling of the cells. And I think one of the key players is probably there's different endogenous levels of WINT from one line to another, or different endogenous, we know there's different endogenous levels of, of nodal signaling from one line to another. And that alone is gonna skew. Now why that is, it's maybe the way we make the cells, the way that we use the cells. For sure they're not all, I mean you know better than I, they're not all locked into the same state when you have them. My guess is that it's more than that than, than actually an in vivo, uh, of much in vivo significance. But you have to do it. So if there's small molecules that would drive BMP and Hactivin, that would be really good. It's an interesting thought, though, because uh, birth defects often arise in a somewhat stochastic matter, and it could be that some uh, are able to tweak better than sure. others and adjust, uh, and that could be an But it's a really interesting thought. Well, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Gordon for a wonderful lecture and congratulating him again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. out here. Okay, I'll just leave yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, uh, in closing, uh, let me just uh, thank again uh, the Ogawas, uh, Andrew and Marcus here on Betty's uh, uh, Sons. Uh, couldn't be here today, but they continue to support the reward, and we're grateful for their ongoing support. Uh, we're grateful for the uh, Roddenberry family for supporting our stem cell center here at Gladstone, which has facilitated much of the beautiful work done here locally in the stem cell and regenerative medicine field. And I, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, the number of people at Gladstone that have worked hard to put together this event uh, each year. It takes a big group effort uh, from our communications department of facilities and many others, uh, led really by Megan McDevitt. So uh, please join me in thanking all of them. And thank you all uh, for uh, joining us today and all of the uh, online audience as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>